uh, thank you everyone for coming to this event. I'm Trevor Berg. I'm a leader of Mustang Rocketry. We're excited to have you all here. The, it's kind of on short notice of the announcements getting out and putting on the website. So whoever, wherever you heard it from, from the professors or anything else, we're glad you're here and glad you're able to make it. Neil Milberg, Mr. Neil Milberg here is a man that needs no introduction and he'll probably introduce himself and his history and everything else. And so without that, we're just going to turn it over to him and he can give us an exciting uh, talk about everything. So <laughs> later on, he needs to get more history of me than we really wanted. Uh, but uh, when I first got the invitation, it was, uh, hey, we'd like to learn about uh, how you started in aerospace, uh, what you're doing now in aerospace, and what's the path forward from that. Uh, and the best way to answer some of the questions that were posed, did you send those, Trevor? It was like four or five questions. Yes, some of the questions, questions came from me as well as other rocketry okay. Okay. So, so the, the best way I can answer those questions is by kind of giving you a pointed history about how I literally got to where I am today. Uh, so the first half hour probably boring as all hell, but uh, at least it let you know what my background is. Uh, currently COO of Exos Aerospace for my sins. Um, this is my 13th job, I think, since uh, since I graduated from university. Um, this slide that I stole from uh, a presentation I, I gave when I was the teacher at Plano West. Um, I used to run the science fair program there, and I taught AP chemistry for seven years. And any of you have been through the AP program know that between AP exams and the end of the semester, there's like two, three weeks of just pure boredom, except in my classes, in which case you got to listen through, a, um, uh, it was a four, four period, four, four times two, it was eight hours lecture period on pseudoscience and the scientific method, which I stole part of it from Physics Quad 3, 3333, which used to be taught by Randy Scalise here. I don't know who teaches it now or if it's still going, um, but I, I met Randy oh, years ago. Uh, and when he, I saw a little piece of this, I said, hey, if you don't mind, I'm going to steal some of those and develop a program. So that's what we used to do in that window between the school closing down and the AP exams. So this slide was, is as well. I used to teach it to the entire um, grade, 12th grade and 11th grade at Plano West um, in the big auditorium there. So that was for people that didn't know me. Uh, that's beautiful Middlesbrough in the county of Cleveland in North Yorkshire. Uh, that's where I grew up. That's about the right time era when I was born, 1950. And I can tell it's the right time era because of that street light there, which is gas powered. Um, the next slide, I think, let me go back to that one. That was about the conditions in Middlesbrough at the time. It was heavily polluted. We were iron and steel. We had coal mines there. Uh, it was a heavy duty port. Um, Imperial Chemicals was the biggest employer in the, uh, in the area. Uh, and the, it was that kind of smog all the time. That's why I'm still coughing. In fact, I used to get woken up in the morning by the birds coughing on the rooftops. There was one species that had learned to fly backwards so it didn't get grit size. That's not the street where I was born, but it's damn close. If that guy with a camera had just gone like this, uh, he'd have been looking at my front door in, uh, in Middlesbrough. And the reason I like this slide better than looking at my front door was, and this is a little bit later, this is going to be 1960, because look, the, uh, the street lamps changed to electric now. Um, but just the other side of that, there was a, a kid called uh, Ivan Jones, and I'm going to blame him for everything else that's happened in my life since. Uh, his Father worked at ICI. He had a chemistry set that was just unbelievable in his in his house. Uh, and we I used to go around. He's a couple of years older than me. He went to the same school that I eventually went to. Uh, and we would brew up all sorts of stuff. And he was the one that actually got me interested in, I won't say aerospace, but rocketry, because we built our very first rocket engine, just a solid yeah, potassium nitrate kind of thing. Um, which is when I learned that scientific curiosity is going to get you a beat in almost every week because we built this rocket motor and we hadn't quite learned that you needed to build up high pressure to make it burn fast. So we put this thing on the roof of their outhouse. There was no inside toilets and there's no bathroom, cold water only, uh, didn't have any hot water in these houses. So we put it on the roof of this outhouse, set it light. Instead of acting like a rocket engine and flying up like we wanted to, it's just like a road flare 
and it burned the roof of his outhouse. So they had a skylight in their outhouse when they stopped what they got fixed. And I got a whoop ass in front of that. I went to Fleet Street Elementary, just I was looking around to see where I am. Looking very smug there. I didn't realize I was that big of a page of the memory. And then this kid here was called Ian Love, the two doors down from me. Um, uh, he played a big role in my life for no good reasons for him. I'll tell you that later. Um, at the age of 11 in England in those days, you sat what's called the 11 plus exam. And that basically dictated what you were going to do for the rest of your life because you went three paths. There was secondary modern school, which basically meant you were going to be a blue collar worker, hands on. Uh, there were the high schools, which meant you, you know, you'd probably still have school until you're about 16 and you can do white collar stuff with office clerical kind of thing. And then there were the grammar schools. And that's about the only school where you stayed the age of 18 and possibly go to university. It wasn't a big thing in my day, especially in Middlesbrough. Um, so this, uh, this school, um, it was built by the Hustler family during the interregnum. So 1697-ish, I think that was when it was finished. So between Charles I and Charles II. Um, beautiful old school. Um, that was the headmaster's study. I spent a lot of time in there because that's where they gave you a caning. Richmond was still allowed in those good old days. Uh, that's the library. I can tell us the library because look, there's some books. Uh, there's a couple more there. I think that's about the sum total of the books in our library at that point. If we wanted to go to a real library, we had to go to the city library downtown, which is a bus drive from where I live. Uh, that is the physics laboratory. Um, I got into trouble with that one. Uh, the chemistry laboratory, note the, uh, the safety glasses. They had any. Uh, and we used to push mercury around on there with our fingers, lick it with your tongues, no problems. I, I got any problems with that class as well. And then uh, these are the, uh, the prison wardens. Um, Mr. Putz, he was my, uh, my class. We used to call them masters. They weren't teachers. So we had headmasters and masters, very, very Hogwarts. Uh, and Mr. Putz was our kind of class leader in the first year I was there. I think he was a warden at a prison or a board or something in Germany when he was younger. Uh, Bob Steele is Russian. He was interesting because at this time, one of my career choices was to, I wanted to be a spy. So I took Russian for two years, top of the class, both years running. And then I realized that life expectancy for spies wasn't very long. So I decided to switch careers at that point. Tom Bull, um, he was our kind of PE guy. Uh, he was wicked. He was just a nasty SOB. Uh, Ron Coveling, biology. I blame him that I'm not a retired doctor living in the south of France. Because remember that street that I showed you where we lived on? What's the first thing he taught in my first year of biology? Plants and trees. You know, and my homework assignment was go collect 10 leaves from different trees. Yeah, right. I had to take a bus ride to a park so I could find 10 leaves from different trees. So if he'd done human biology, I'd be a doctor by now. I was ain't really interested in the human body. Well, okay, I was interested in the girls' bodies. I knew about the male ones. So if he'd done that, I'd be I'd be retired now, living on the beach down in Saint Tropez. Actually, not Saint Tropez. Very just to be nice. Uh, Tom Hurst, headmaster. Uh, he was the one that administered corporal punishment. He's six foot five, weighs about two fifty. Got a wicked head. And you're not going to be able to see the, uh, the ones below there. The screen's shrunk on me. But I think this is uh, that's Mr. Hodgson there, who was my chem teacher. We got on real well. I, I, was, I was more science than I was arts language, hopeless at music. Uh, I got came for that as well. But with, uh, with Hodgson, he was an amazing guy. Um, and he would, he made me take the, um, you know, we have O levels and A levels, which is the equivalent is over here. Uh, and then had an S level as well, a special level. And if you wanted to go to one of the big schools, Oxford, Cambridge, uh, you had to sit S levels as well. So I had S level chemistry. And he'd do a lot of stuff extracurricular. We'd stay back and play with, play with stuff. He taught me about um, nitrogen triiodide. You ever played with that stuff? 
No, that's wicked cool. You gotta look it up on the internet. Uh, it's simple to make. It's just ammonia and iodine crystals. And you let them sit for a little while, wait the ammonia evaporates. And what's left are these little dark purple crystals that's a contact explosive. And the feather will set this stuff off. So what I used to do was bring it up, we put it down and then put some kind of junk next to it. And it was like a, an atomic bomb for flies that come down to walk on the food, little purple mushroom clouds. But I used to dry it off in the window wedge in that chem lab. Uh, and it would, uh, it would have this horrible habit of floating all around the school. So people walk on those little purple mushroom clouds coming up around their feet. I got the cane for that one. Uh, and then the other guy, where's he hidden? He's up, he moved towards me. He's up there. Uh, that's Baker. Uh, he was my physics instructor. We got on real well as well because of the science bent. And for my project, I was doing um, maglev. And I communicated with a guy down at um, Imperial College London, um, Professor Eric Blakethwaite. He, he tried to get me to go down there when I went to university. And he gave me a lot of help with, with the process of maglev. And I built a maglev. It looked like it's on a train. It was a plate that operated on the coils. And it worked really well. It went straight through the wall into the chem lab. So I got the cane for that one as well. Scientific curiosity is going to get you an asshole. Get rid of those guys. Uh, somehow, I managed to graduate and get a, a scholarship to the uh, University of Leeds in England. Um, there were two big chem engineering schools at that time so where I took it to university. Uh, there was London Imperial, and there was Leeds Holdsworth School of Engineering. And I would have liked to have gone down to London, but you saw the background I grew up in. There was no chance in hell I was going to be able to afford to live down in, in London. So I went to, uh, to Leeds for, for four years. That was 68 through 72. It was a great time to be alive. I sometimes feel sorry for you guys. Um, it was flower power, free love, and then all the British pop groups coming up. Um, for some reason, Leeds University's refectory, which was kind of a cafeteria area, was huge for drawing big name groups in there. I mean, the, the cafeteria held 2,000 people standing up or sitting down. There were no chairs in there. There was nothing to sit on. Uh, and because some of the names up there, uh, that was the best indoor concert ever. That went to anyway, Pink Floyd in, uh, in 1970. They played, you might be able to find it on the internet from an old BBC archive. They never recorded it on, uh, on disc, um, but there's a song called Embryo. And I remember we were all sitting on the floor, listening to this, and I was just gobsmacked. It was phenomenal. And they finished, and there was deathly silence. I'm, what the hell is it? Did anybody else enjoy that? Then the place just erupted. They're all the same as me, just yeah, absolutely taken away with this song. So that's when I started going to these uh, these dances for uh, uh, to to listen to music rather than just going there to pick up girls and drink beer. Uh, March seventy one, John Day on the Blues Breakers, Led Zeppelin, the Stones, and the Kinks all in eleven days. And then the Who live at Leeds, uh, big rock fans you guys are. That was voted the best rock album, live rock album ever produced for forever. Uh, it was just an amazing time to be there. It used to cost me 10 shillings to go and see these guys. So that's like a dollar. Um, and a pint of beer, I think, used to cost me two shillings at the time. So that was big money. Five beers it cost me to get into this place. But it was, it was just phenomenal. Uh, John Heisman's Coliseum, they were there a couple of times. The Who I at least. I think that I was actually at that concert in 70 when they recorded the album. Uh, and then Pink Floyd, I must have seen those guys three times there, a couple of times outside there. Um, it, when I was doing this, it was kind of almost bring me to tears because I, last week I went to the Joe Bonamassa concert in, uh, in Grand Prairie. Phenomenal guitarist, best guitarist I've heard in the last 20 odd years. This was 50 years ago. This is the last time I went to a live rock concert was with these guys back in, uh, in 71, 72. Uh, somehow, I managed to uh, to graduate um, with a degree in chemical engineering, and I say somehow, 
71, New Year's Eve, I went to a pub, strangely, uh, during the Christmas break. Remember that kid I showed you down on the bottom corner there, Ian Lum, my buddy next door? It's not my buddy anymore. Uh, he'd taken this good-looking redhead to uh, to the pub, and he took her, and I left with her. I never spoke with him again after that. Um, and it got kind of serious with this girl. Um, so I thought, oh, we're going to, I better find, I need to graduate so I can get a job and make a living. So that last six months, five months, um, I crammed four years of engineering study into, into that period. That's my word, I knew how to cram. Um, and I did graduate with, uh, with a degree in chem eng, which was just as well because that redhead is now my wife and we celebrate 50th wedding anniversary this uh, this December, December 8th. So just in time for the global recession. Uh, this is sort of the what I, reason I'm going back this far and going through the history, and I'll try and go a little bit quicker, uh, is a, a lot of the things that I've learned over the year is that you're going to get some shit times coming forward. I mean, it, life just throws you curveballs every time you start around. So the year that I graduated, which was 1972, Imperial Chemicals, ICI, laid off 200 top-ranked chemical engineers because of the global recession, which was exactly twice the number of graduating snotty nose kids in, the, in my chem -Eng class. So we're, we're walking into a market where we got no chance whatsoever of getting into our chosen profession of chemical engineering. I joined a company called Bearward Radiators. Um, fairly large company, I think about 600 people in the area that I was in. It was actually in Leeds, which is how I got to London. Uh, they were part of Imperial Metals, which in turn was part of Imperial Chemicals, and they had tens of thousands of people uh, worldwide. And my job was the um, design and also the sales and marketing side of the, uh, of the heat exchanger systems on these. So the, uh, the cooling systems, the air conditioning, um, the oil coolers, all the hydraulic coolers. So that's the um, that's the Chieftain tank, the main battle tank at the time for the uh, British military. Uh, that one's the Rolls Royce Silver Ghost, I think. So I did the Ghost, the Phantom, the one other I can't remember. Uh, the Jag, which is my favorite, XJ6, XJ8. Those were uh, those were both mine. And that was the uh, much fated Triumph TR7 Project Bullet. It was a nice little car, but it just didn't sell very well. But I also got to play with some of the exotics. So we'd go across to Italy and test drive Lamborghinis and Ferraris. So it was a good time when you're 20 odd years old. Uh, but I learned very quickly that I don't like being a small cog in a very large machine. So tens of thousands of people. I quit there and went to join an outfit called Bearwood Radiators, which eventually got me across to the States. Uh, Bear Ward was a small family-owned company. When I joined them, I was employee number 13. So I went from 13,000 to 13 people total. And we used to make these large radiators for, for diesel generators. Um, when I joined them, they were assembling parts. They actually used to buy radiator cores from, uh, from my old company, Marston. So I put them into the manufacturing business. We did everything in-house. Phenomenal success over a period of about four or five years. We dominated the market in the UK with the product that we were making. We had 80% of the total market. Um, I'd found out in my prior job that I was pretty damn good at sales and marketing. So not only did I do the engineering side of this, I was also the guy out front doing the, uh, I keep saying S&M, but that means something different nowadays. Um, I was with those guys for a long time, and then, oh, guess what? Another bloody recession comes along. Um, it was the petrol crisis, I think. And our order book just collapsed overnight. It went from four months to about four weeks in the space of 24 hours. So at the board meeting, um, we got into a, our board meetings were interesting. They often would result in violence, bodily violence. It got quite spirited. But the um, production manager at that time, production director, said we should be trying to go after the other 20%. And then, what the hell's the use in that? I mean, it's it's pitiful. This job is people would fire your customers. A good expression. There were several of those customers. I didn't want them um, if they paid me to take their stuff. 
I was pushing, like, hey, let's move into another market. Let's start looking at Europe. I mean, we haven't touched Europe at all. We got a couple of handful of orders, but that's about it. Um, and I lost the, uh, the battle at the board meeting. So at the time, one of my customers was an outfit called Rig Design Services. Um, they were down in London. They designed and built offshore drilling platforms. That's not one of theirs. Um, they used to build Mount Stavanger in Norway, and their head office was in London, just 70 miles south. So I used to commute daily down on the train to the work to London. And it was an interesting time. I didn't spend very long there, about two years. Um, the owners were three Australian guys. Um, used to be with mobile in Australia, came across here and started Rig Design Services. There were five direct employees. The other 200 were all country. So it was the three owners. There was a secretary that one of the owners really liked, so he put her up full time. And I was the other guy that was the fifth direct employee. Um, but during that period, uh, I was not a big fan of their business practices or the code of moral ethics. Um, so I decided I need to walk out of this before I end up in prison with them. Some of the stuff they were doing was, was not legit. Uh, and lo and behold, um, I remember driving back on the, come back on the train one Friday night and I switched my one, pulled into a pub just outside the village we lived in. And there's the managing director of Bearwood and uh, we commiserated with each other. The director who I'd had the argument with had left, taken several employees, most of the IP, and started his own company in direct competition. Um, and he was looking for a way to resurrect the company again. And he said, uh, would you be interested in doing our international sales and marketing? So I quit my job that evening in, uh, in London signed up i was in the office again on monday and we started into the european market and we we rapidly dominated that as well our product was tremendous and our price structure was good but we got to a point where we're, we're plateauing there's no more business there that we can get within reason so what do we do okay it worked for europe what about going somewhere else so my job on the marketing side was okay where else can we get our product in uh, I looked at Singapore for Southeast Asia. Uh, I visited India. Um, there's that pretty good market there. Uh, Scandinavia, never did get down to, uh, to Australasia. Um, and then I came to the States. And it was like, what the hell are we doing looking anywhere else? The stateside market was the size of the rest of the world combined. So this was 1981. Um, I came out here. Did the marketing trip and then on the plane back i put a business plan together to literally set up a, a subsidiary of the english company over here pitched it to the managing director when i got back and he said okay job's yours and then in december of 81 um i came across the states um my wife followed me just before christmas and we literally took up residence just outside of philadelphia and I set up Bearwood Radiators USA, you can see on the top of that, um, which was a, a greenfield startup. This was really my first, first startup venture from scratch. And it was me and a little laptop, a millennium laptop computer at that time, uh, and a scratch pad starting from, from square one. And we had a really good, really good run with, with Bearwood USA until, guess what? Another bloody recession in, uh, in Europe. So we were doing fine over here. But my parent company was sucking cash out just as fast as I could generate it. So the only way I could keep this thing rolling was I found a, a buyer for the subsidiary operation because it was, it was a distributorship. We weren't manufacturing. We needed to set up manufacturing for it to, where to go the next leap. Uh, found a buyer, sold it. Turned out he didn't want to do manufacturing. He literally wanted to just keep distributing. He was one of my customers, so we had to use his role internally. So I quit there. And then went to Energy Industries, moved to Texas. Uh, Energy Industries was down in Garland, Texas. It was a subsidiary of Energy Industries in um, Corpus Christi, which in turn was a subsidiary of Holt Caterpillar of Texas, Peter Holt, grandson of Benjamin Holt, who invented the Caterpillar tractor. Uh, and they used to make these huge air coolers for the oil and gas industry. That's uh, like a Walkershaw 16 cylinder. Yeah. 
a gas compressor, so three stage. So you take gas pressure coming out of the ground at 20 pounds per square inch and you pump it up to pipeline, which is 1300 in the US and 1400 in, in Canada. Um, good little operation. Uh, it was a turnaround. These guys were broken. Their engineering sucked. They couldn't design them to save their lives. So I rewrote all of their software for that, um, turned around their manufacturing piece of it, didn't do any of the sales side that was done out of Corpus Christi. Um, but then energy industry decided they wanted to sell this subsidiary and they sold it to an outfit in Tulsa and it just did not smell right to me. Uh, they're just buying market share and what they'll do is they'll run it for six months a year and then just close this down and suck everything up to Tulsa which is what they eventually did. I didn't want to be a part of that. So I moved on to Amacool. Um, Amacool was a broken company, a subsidiary of Smith Co. in Tulsa. These guys are out in um, Tyler, White House, just out of Tyler. Uh, and again, it was bleeding to death. Um, the people that were running it didn't know jack shit. Uh, so I took that over as, as general manager. Uh, we turned it around in the very first year. We went, uh, we went, positive profit in year one, actually made a fairly decent profit in uh, in year two. But the guy that originally owned Amapool had sold it to the Smiths, um, Roy and Judy Smith were the owners of Tulsa private company. Um, thought I was getting a bit too close to Roy and Judy, so didn't fight that one. But yeah, okay, time to move on. Um, it was a good call because not long after I decided to leave here and do something else, uh, he did the same thing as my production manager back in England. Uh, he stole some employees, he stole the IP, uh, and he moved off and started up a company in direct competition. To, I'm hoping it died over there. Uh, next step, okay. Um, David Koch. You know, the Koch brothers in, uh, in Kansas, Kansas and New York. As well. um, David Koch is the younger of the two brothers, and he handled the, uh, the non-pipeline side of the business. Uh, he'd heard of me because of what I was doing down in, uh, at Amacool. And he said, hey, we're, we're interested in starting up our own heat exchanger company. We've got a huge internal uh, market for it. Um, would you do a six-month research project for us and tell us what we need to do to get that? I uh, forget what year that was now. And I presented to uh, David Koch and the board of, uh, of Koch um, a business plan to start up Koch Industrial Coolers, KRC. 20 minute presentation, 10 minutes QA. Okay, 50 million, no problem. Do you want to run it? So, uh, okay, I'm not doing anything else at the moment. I'll immigrate to Oklahoma. We lived up in Tulsa for a couple of years. Uh, and we started that company up from uh, from scratch again, blank sheet of paper. We did our laptop computers this time, and did that for about two years. The parent company that we were a subsidiary of was a company called in Canada, um, Finex. No, not Finex. Come for me now, Effin. Um, and the guy that was involved with me starting that, press, that, that that whole company up, decided to leave and do something else. They brought a new guy in from GE who knew absolutely jack shit about the business we were in. And he was trying to mess with the way that we're doing this. I think, yeah, this ain't gonna work, but it's all yours. So I quit that. And I was driving back down home. All my kids live down here in the Dallas area. So I'm back down, it's a four hour drive on that far off of Indian Parkway place. Uh, and I had a, a, a brainstorm on these coolers here. The little one, oh, and there's another one there. Um, these are high pressure helium compressors. This is where I first kind of got into the aerospace side of it. Um, all of the shuttle launches, but almost any aerospace launch has got bunches of helium on there. They used to use about a million to $2 million worth of helium for every shuttle launch, more if they had to scroll. So they bring tankers of liquid helium in, uh, they've got to gasify it, and then they pump it up to 5,000 PSI and then send it down the pipe to the, uh, the shuttle launch pad. Uh, these little heat exchangers are god awful expensive. And they're gonna be able to handle 5,000 pounds per square inch. Uh, and then also helium's just a bitch to work with. 
do. We'll escape through a NASA asshole. It'll leak out of that. It's almost about as hydrogen, except it doesn't burn. I, and I did just literally just an idea while I was driving, and I pitched it to the guy at, uh, at Henderson while I was there, a good guy called Jack Herb. Uh, and literally the next day, I agreed to sign on with them. I set them up in manufacturing, those specialty heat exchangers, took over the, uh, the engineer in the shop. Um, they also used to make um, that's a heating compressor, that's a small air compressor. They also used to do natural gas vehicular. And we take pipeline gas and pump it up to 3,500 pounds per square inch, which you then cascade fill into uh, into vehicles. I quit that. They had a guy they were looking to do the same thing that um, the guys in Tulsa had done. They sold it to uh, one of the big outfits. I wasn't sold, I think it was Atlas Copco. And I knew as soon as they did that, okay, they bought this for market share and the technology. They're going to suck it across to the East Coast, and this place will close down, which they eventually did a year out that way. I was in my early 50s at that time, and I was bloody tired. I mean, it, startups and turnarounds suck the life out of you. I mean, you do nothing else. You know, you eat, sleep, and work, and that's about it. I, after, I really don't want to do another startup. I don't want to do another turnaround. Uh, I want to take a breather for a while. So I, I call it my first retirement. Um, I took up teaching and I taught uh, IB and APC physics for, for six years at, um, at Plano East. In the background, back in 2000, um, I met a guy called John Carmack. And some of you guys may know him from his, um, his software days. It's software, so Quake and Doom and Wolfenstein, one of those games. That was his brainchild. Guy is freaking genius. He, he operates on a different astral plane to the rest of us. He, he's like Elon Musk in a lot of respects, except Elon's more business side than, than John ever was. So um, I was my hobby at that time was uh, was <laughs> building hobby rockets, high power hobby rockets. Uh, back then. That time, I think I had uh, Spirit in the Sky 3, 15 feet tall, foot diameter, had an N-class core motor and four outboard J motors. And to be a level three high power rocketeer, you had to not only fabricate every bit of the rocket, you had to actually brew your own rocket propellant um, with, with ammonia, ammonia perchlorate and aluminum powder. Um, and I think at that time, I was the first level three rocketeer in the state of Texas. Might have been another guy out in Amarillo, but I, I think I beat him to it. So we're doing that in the background. And Dallas Area Rocket Society, which is our local outfit, said, hey, there's a guy in town. He just wants to do something out in the ordinary. And we don't know anybody more out in the ordinary than you. Uh, so there's myself, uh, a guy called Russell Blink. Um, and Phil Eaton. We were the three original people that joined with John Carmack, and we started Armadillo Aerospace. At that time, it was just literally, we called the Armadillo Aerospace, which was just a bunch of guys getting together during the week and weekends, trying not to blow each other up. Um, but it was, we, man, we got through some phenomenal stuff in that, that period while I was still working here. I, but then I retired. Armadillo Aerospace became a big thing. We won prizes in the uh, Northrop Grumman Lunar Lander Challenge, uh, both level one and level two, which was a really interesting vehicle. Uh, but we also built um, the STIG, suborbital transport with inertial guidance, contrived acronym. Uh, and it's just a suborbital rocket, small payloads to, uh, to 100 kilometers. We used to launch that out of uh, Spaceport America at the end of New Mexico. Uh, it was the Scorpius Lunar Lander. That's one we won the level two Northrop Grumman Prize with. And if you're not familiar with it, uh, this one is, uh, is NOx ethanol. Those are two high pressure uh, even tanks on the outside. It's a pressure fed. Uh, what you had to do was take off from one pad, um, ascend to 50 meters or thereabouts, translate 100 meters, and then land on a simulated lunar surface. And you had to be up in the air for three minutes. That delta V was the equivalent of landing something on the lunar surface. So not insignificant. But then you had to refuel it, turn it around, and send it back again. Same thing, three minutes in the air. Um, 
same kind of delta V on the on that one. And we did that out at Caddo Mills. Some of you guys were out at our Caddo Mills test site some time back. That's where we actually did that, that, that launch. That's the Caddo Mills test site in the back. At the same time, we uh, we built a rocket-powered airplane for the Rocket Racing League. They never did make it off the ground, no pun intended. Not because of anything they did. There was a crash at the Reno Airshow, where I think it was a modified P-51 that cartwheeled into the stand and killed a whole bunch of people. So when these guys are going out to get their license to run this thing, it's, okay, what do you want to do? Well, we want to fly a rocket-powered airplane past 50,000 people in the stands. Okay, good job. So they never did, they didn't get off the ground. We built two of those and we did fly them at the Tulsa Air Show side by side. I forget what year that was now. So that's a man, man rocket powered plane. It's pretty cool. Uh, there were problems with Armadillo Aerospace not related to what we were doing. Um, John's wife, Anna Carmack, or Anna Kang, if she ever changed to Carmack, um, was a strange woman. My job was to act as a go-between between, between the team and, uh, and Anna. She was held with financial purse strings. And I really can't blame her. One of my slides further on is you've got to do what's right for the family. Uh, and she persuaded John that there were better opportunities for her and her family if John did something else. So we put Armadillo Aerospace into hibernation. Um, John went off and became the CTO at Oracle. Uh, those 3D goggly things you guys play with. Um, they were having horrible problems with those things. The early models that they had, if you turned your head too quickly, a little while later, the thing would swing around to where you're supposed to be looking at. So that was John's job, was to fix all that stuff, which he did in a heartbeat. Um, I know that Anna wouldn't have let him take that job on for less than 25% of the company. They sold to Facebook for $2 billion a year after. So John became independently wealthy. He's since retired from there. Um, and he's now a, an independent gentleman scientist living in a bunker somewhere outside of San Antonio working on an artificial humanoid, which he'll do. Um, oh, that was that's one of my favorite photographs. Do you know who that guy is? Holy shit. Nobody. Neil Armstrong? Yeah, it's Neil Armstrong. I met him at a conference out in California. That is literally three months before he passed away. Um, and uh, Buzz Aldrin, I met a bunch of times. He, he was the most humble man you could ever wish to meet. Buzz Aldrin, not so much. He's a cranky old bastard. Um, but that was probably the, the biggest thing we did with Armadillo Aerospace was, was Project Orpheus. Having built the Scorpius lunar lander in one level of competition, um, NASA Johnson Space Center asked us to build a, a lunar lander that would use their methane, Lox methane engine, and to test out something called ALHAT, Autonomous Landing Hazard Avoidance Technology. So when we return to the moon, this thing will take over instead of Neil Armstrong guiding that thing down, it's done, not done electronically. It's not well known and they don't advertise the fact. We almost lost three of those birds on the moon, those landers. Uh, there was one that was sitting with a leg over, uh, over a, a hole. There was another one that had a leg that was up on the side of a rock. Uh, and even Neil Armstrong's first one where he's gliding that thing down. That guy was a miracle worker. So Alhat takes away that piece of the, the puzzle. It's all done now by computer control. And In five, four, three, you one. You know,
That was down at Kennedy Space Center, right by the side of the main shuttle runway. Um, the custom built those those paths just went down. When we tested that vehicle at Cata Mills, just to the east of us here in Texas, uh, our team consisted of six people. The same, yeah, the same six people could run any program. They have 200 for that launch out at uh, Kennedy Space Center. That's the federal government. Uh, so I guess uh, we, we, we closed down Armadillo Aerospace. Um, I was no good at retiring. So I started teaching again at uh, Plano West. Um, there I was doing AP chemistry, did that for about seven years. And then I uh, unretired again. Um, and actually this is, a, this is a real retirement. Um, 1970, uh, in May of 1970, I turned 70. I also had to put up all that COVID crap for the beginning of that year, which is absolutely disastrous. We got on okay in my class because I'd already instituted um, a different kind of program where we taught the lectures at night and then they came in at the next work during the day, the classroom model. Um, but it was absolutely uh, hideous. When I retired the first time properly, my youngest son, Nate, um, had just become a doctor of sports medicine. Um, He's also the team doctor for you guys for, uh, for sports, basketball, football. I think he's done the girls volleyball as well. Um, and his first position was up at UPenn. That's where he did his fellowship in Europe. So he was team doctor for the Philadelphia Eagles, the Flyers, the Phillies. Um, and he moved his family up there, a young family. They had the two kids. One was only six months at the time. So I said, okay, we do nothing. We'll move up there with you. We, we lived in Philadelphia, so we, we can give you a hand up there. So my wife and I both moved up with them in the summer of 70. Uh, for me, it lasted until the March of the following year. Uh, and that's when Exos came around. Exos, Russ and Phil and some finance guys, John Quinn, our CEO, and David Mitchell, who's our, our president, um, bought the IP from John Carmack, he actually gave it to them because uh, he wanted to see it go on. It was his wife that really made him shut the company down. Um, they bought the IP, uh, they started building a rocket called Sarge, even while I was playing with, uh, with teaching at West uh, and then my time up there, I helped them write the launch license for, for the, their next vehicle. Uh, whenever they were launching, I go out and be the safety officer for the launches. That's what I've done in the, in the past. And then in March of, uh, of 71, they got a contract from the U.S. Air Force to build uh, a concept hypersonic launch vehicle that had to be reusable. Uh, you had nine months to do it in, from a piece of paper to something that would fly. So we were the only people who could do something like that. So they called me um, in the March and said, uh, hey, do you want to play? I said, yeah, I'm not much good at this retirement shit. There's only so many times you can go fishing with a grandson uh, and then go to Chick-fil-A and have lunch and then come back home and go for a walk down by the Delaware River. So I said, yeah, okay, come on, come in. Uh, so I signed up as CEO March of 71, and here I am still. This video, I think, was from the first, first launch of Sarge. This is Spaceport America, if you guys are going out there. This is the southern end of the range, the vertical launch area. John Glenn and uh, that's Russ Glenn. He's our tech genius. We're gonna have to stop doing that. DOD frowns on that. Duct tape. Rocket still on fire without duct tape. <laughs> you plan on firing your rocket? Put a piece of duct tape on. Just better way.
So that's about 10 kilograms to 100 kilometers. Um, the new rocket is the Block 3. Looks like come on, oh, it's next. Uh, block 3, which is good for about 135 kilograms to 100 kilometers. The smaller payloads up to about 150. But it's fully reusable. Um, you saw the nose cone coming down there. But the main vehicle um, gets rid of any excess propellant because any left over. And then it has two staking cone systems. It's got that balloon that comes out of the nose cone uh, and at about 10 kilometers, maybe yeah, two kilometers. Uh, that flies away on its own and then it releases a paraglide chute that's, uh, that's got an automatic guidance system in it. So it really fly glides it back to the launch pad where you're sitting, puts it down right at, uh, at your feet. So that rocket there flew four times before we uh, did a shuttle recovery on it. Uh, Get the nose in front of the crater head. So we've uh, moving on from that. Where are we at now? Um, about a year ago, we started trying to raise our Series A raise, uh, three hundred and fifty million ish. Um, took a long time to do that. We're dealing with some guys in the United Arab Emirates, Dubai. Uh, I don't think we're dealing with them too much longer. But in the interim, what we proposed to do was to uh, build what was called Project Altos which was an air launch to orbit, uh, LOX, Hero, I think at that stage, maybe LOX hydrogen. Um, and in the interim, Virgin Orbit went belly up. That's one of the worst managed companies I've seen in my life. Um, we went out um, just after the bankruptcy was called to talk with um, the management out there and then sent to the courts for disposition. Uh, they had invested $1.5 billion in that company over a period of about 10 years, most of it in the last five or six, um, had four successful launches, two failures. So it's, it's not a bad little system. It's a lot of engineering things we didn't like in it that we could fix. Uh, when it went to auction, uh, they raised a grand total of $75 million from the 1.5 billion. Um, we're now working with, we have a, just this this week, Tuesday this week, our CEO was out in California talking with the Defense Innovation Unit, DIU. Uh, we've partnered with a company called Strata Launch. Uh, they bought this piece of it, the airplane. Um, we've already talked with Virgin Orbit, um, sorry, with a company called Firefly. Firefly bought uh, three rockets in various stages of assembly of Launch One. Uh, we're going to buy that piece of it. And then there's a third company that had to bring in for a satellite. Uh, what DIU wants to do under a project called Victor's Hayes uh, is they're going to give you 30 days notice um, that you're going to have to launch to a specific trajectory. They won't tell you what that trajectory is. You just got 30 days, so you better be ready. When they give you the call, you've got 24 hours to get that bird up into orbit. And the orbit's going to be very specific. We want you to rendezvous with that satellite in that orbit there. So um, the presentation of them was Tuesday this week. Um, looking real good, as long as you can talk with the Department of Defense. Uh, so we'll buy those launcher ones, bring them here to North Texas, fix the design problems with them, and complete out. Um, I think that was. First one available is launcher one number eight, stack eight. Uh, and stack eight will get ready, and we strap it onto that ship probably out in Mojave and do the demo launch from, uh, from, from that place. It's about a fifty million dollar project from the uh, from the DIU, uh, but we'll also have the other two, and we intend to launch those as well, but for commercial or military customers that are out there using the same partnership as, uh, as this one. Uh, that's the block three. We built the Block 3 under that Air Force contract. Um, it's good for, say, about 135 kilograms to 100 kilometers. Um, we've got a wet lease that should be signed. What's the date today? Oh, I know. Um, 15th, so Wednesday of next week. Uh, we should get a wet lease contract to build that vehicle out and do two back-to-back -back launches from Spaceport America in September of uh, next year. So that'll be kind of a standalone little business. We'll probably base it out of Midland because uh, we get some funding out of those guys. Um, and then about a month ago, 
we were asked to submit um, by Air Force Research Laboratory, AFRL, out of uh, Dayton, Ohio. Um, there's a new engine, not a new engine technology, it's been around for a while, uh, rotating detonation rocket engine, RDREs. Um, the University of Purdue has built one, which I think is about a 2,000 pound thrust. Um, NASA Johnson Space Center, uh, NASA Johnson NASA Johnson Space Center has built one, which I think about 5,000 pounds thrust. Um, it's good, okay, they've done it on a test stand. It's a boilerplate engine. What they want to do is um, do a build, a build a vehicle like the Scorpio. It's not that size, obviously, for the kind of thrust it's got, but they want to be able to fly that thing. It's okay to test on a test stand, but you don't know what the hell is going to go wrong with it till we actually get that puppy up in the air. So we put in the proposal for that, for the phase one um, proposal, where you do all the engineering work. Uh, and then the phase two follow on, where we actually build that vehicle, um, install their engine, and, uh, and actually test it. And we propose doing a whole bunch of different things. So I think we can make it a point to point lander uh, over a fairly decent range, depending on what the performance of that engine is. And then the block four, I can't tell you too much about that. Um, we're working jointly with Lockheed Martin. Um, the block three that we built there was literally a, a concept vehicle. It's made with um, lightweight fiber, carbon fiber compounds, linerless tanks, even for the, uh, the liquid oxygen, um, reduces the weight massive, which is why we can launch 100 kilograms rather than one kilogram to 100 kilometers. Uh, Use exactly the same, uh, same engine. Um, Using that same now proven technology, uh, we propose the block four, which is air launch. I guess what? Well, we've got an airplane that can launch that one. Um, and it's probably going to be LOX hydrogen. We may move to LOX Caro for just operational things for the military. Um, it's got a delta wing on there. It's going to have obviously a lot of high temperature composite stuff on the ass on uh, and the, uh, the, the wings of the nose. And then a little dihedral on the back, just helping with this launch. And they might have a front canard on as well, didn't show it on that. That's why we do the, the drop on that so it doesn't drop too far. Um, so that one, I think they'll wait to see what happens with this. That's our two year program from start to finish. It's not too many people can build that in that time. Um, but if that proves outright, then okay, we've got an actual carrier vehicle to work for that. So that's the uh, the flow chart for the potted history I gave you there. It almost took me 70 years to tell you. Um, 13 different jobs during my career, starting off in the UK and moving to the US, even immigrated to Tulsa for a while in Oklahoma. Um, so what did I learn from all that? What, what can you guys benefit from what I learned during that time? You don't need to be an aerospace engineer to work in aerospace. I'm a chem edge. You guys are like 90% of your mech edge. Uh, when we start ramping up the uh, this first project, we're going to need mechanical, electric, mechanical, and council, which says, well, mechanical, say design, finance, manufacturing, test materials, environmental, legal. Yeah, we need bloody lawyers as well. Uh, and then if we start doing the math stuff, yeah, that might outlive me. Uh, then you need bioengineers, doctors, psychologists. Uh, and it goes the other way as well. Uh, an education in any STEM, you can apply into almost any business. Now, if you look at my background, I'm a chemical engineer, but I've worked in all those different industries. I don't know, I'm a class teacher or some industry. Uh, it's probably more profitable than some of the others. But in all of those with that degree. And then from an aerospace standpoint, I'm self-taught. All of the Armadillo Aerospace Exos people are self-taught. None of us had a degree in aerospace engineering. It's a good business. It, it pays really well. Uh, college graduates in petro and aerospace are making a hundred grand straight out of college. Uh, right now, I know all of the oil guys are bitching like hell because of what Biden's doing to the oil and gas business. They are raking in money. They kind of say, ah, oh, he's a bad guy. <laughs> Idiot. They're, we've got truck drivers out there hauling away the wastewater from, uh, from the well. There's a lot of water with the wells out in, uh, in West Texas. And they drive this away. They have to pump it back in the ground again to dispose of it. 
truck drivers earn a hundred grand a year. Part of a way to make a living, but hundred grand a year for driving a truck. But yeah, college graduates are, are earning a hundred grand plus out in Midland. Uh, in the aerospace industry, it's going to be a hundred grand plus. Uh, when we kick up our orbital program, I think it's going to be Jan 1. DIU said that they're going to make a decision before the end of the, the year. Uh, we're going to need, we have three different levels of engineers. The, the gray beards, we're going to have to pull some people in, probably from Virgin. Uh, and those guys are going to be 180 grand a year. And then there's a kind of a mid level, somebody who's worked in aerospace before or some related engineering um, discipline. Uh, they'll be in the middle of that. And they'll say entry levels at 100 to 110 grand by. C-suite, I'm glad to say, that's a little bit more than that even. Um, ranges of about 250 to 200 for a startup company. And then once you're probing yourself and you're actually generating profit, it's about twice that in the work for C-suite. Brain drop-ins. Do what you enjoy and you'll never work a day in your life. Bullshit. It's, not, it's nothing so untrue. Uh, do what you enjoy, and yeah, you, you could enjoy your work, but you are working your ass off, believe me. I can testify for 50 odd years of, uh, of that. Uh, and the twist of that is, unless you enjoy a profession that's not in demand or oversubscribed, we'll talk a little bit about AI before we close out, uh, in which case you might not work a day in your life. When life gives you lemons, was it make lemonade? No, shit, go look for the next bottle of scotch. <laughs> You don't, you've got to know when to walk out. I mean, you saw how many times during that career of 50 odd years that, that I've decided, no mass, it's, it's time, you know, move on, do something else. Don't stick with something. Don't try and fight your way out of it. If it looks like it's going to be a pain, it will be. So don't go looking for pain. Go looking for the next opportunity. Um, virtually every career change that I've had, that's why I showed you all that stuff, um, all the career changes, there was a lemon there. My director at, uh, at Bearwood, the guy at, uh, in Tulsa when I walked away from, uh, from Amico. Um, economy problems. I think I've been through three recessions now in, uh, in global recessions, not particularly our industry. Uh, it, they will come and bite you, and there's going to be more. I mean, it looks like we might be marching towards one now. Uh, recognize when it's time to move on. Do what's best for you and your family. I, mean, I, have, I have a hard time being bitter towards Anna Carmack, John's, John's wife, because she was just doing what was right for her family at the time. Pain in the ass for me, I mean, I had to go find something else to do, uh, but she did what was right there. And something I'm guilty of is not jumping soon enough. Beware of false allegiances. Whenever I've done a startup or a turnaround, I've got people who come to work for me, uh, or there are people there already, and I feel like I'm responsible for, for their livelihood. I mean, they've got families to feed. They've got kids going to school. Uh, if I fail, they're out of a job. So I've always got this nagging thing in the back of my head saying, I, I've got to take care of these folks. And I do my damnedest. But again, I've got to be aware that it's not a false allegiance, but it's a, it's a, it's a misdirection. Do what's right for you and your family. Don't be frightened by failure. Hey, Neil, do you want to start this $50 million company up for the Koch brothers? And the ones I'm reading about in the press that kind of execute you if you don't perform. Uh, yeah, okay, I'll give it a shot. Yeah. Well, how difficult can it be? So yeah, don't be frightened of not trying. That's when you're going to throw it away. You can always pick up. Oh, and this is Melbourne from last year. I kind of break down in tears. I did this at the, um, the Christmas party a couple of years ago in the Texas house, John's house. Um, that's a good, you, ever, you guys ever listen to Jordan Peterson? Yeah, love the guy. He's a little bit strange and he's a little bit too melodramatic, but he is smart. Purpose of life is to find a mode that's so meaningful that suffering is no longer relevant. Don't I'm quite that pessimistic about it. Um, but I, I remember sitting down my wife a couple of years ago and saying, you know, so many people pass through this life. They kick the bucket, English expression, uh, and you wouldn't know that they've been here. What the hell have they left? Um, we were at a funeral yesterday, a guy called Tommy Bishop. 
um, who used to work for us at Armadillo, and he worked for a little while at, at Exos. Super nice guy. Um, and this, they were throwing the photographs off and going, you know, he, he did some stuff with us, and he's got the family ties. I, but what's, is anybody going to remember him after, after this funeral is over? I mean, obviously his family will. Uh, but what difference did, did he make? And I have a hard time being critical of prior generations. I mean, my grandparents fought in World War I. Um, my parents fought in, uh, in World War II. I haven't had to fight a war so far. I hope you guys don't, don't either. So I can't really blame them for not leaving their mark. They spent most of their lives fighting for the freedom of, uh, of the country. But I can't make the same excuse for myself. You know? And I know with the Christmas party, they were saying, well, look, I mean, your, your job is to make sure that your kids have a better life than you did. Okay, I should bloody hope so. Mm -hmm. uh, you saw where I came up. It looks slightly different to Plano. Um, but I don't, I, it just doesn't seem like that's enough to me. Now, what can you do to better humanity? What legacy do you want to leave? You know, and you shouldn't compare yourself to um, Elon Musk. He's a great guy. No, no Elon will. Elon came to visit us at Armadillo Aerospace before he started SpaceX. Guy's like a sponge drawing knowledge out of him. Um, but he's a bloody hard worker. He's smart. He thinks outside the box. Um, and he's going to leave a legacy. He already has left a legacy, right? Some of the stuff he's done now. Um, and I bet you he's probably the first to get us to Mars as well. What can you do to benefit humanity? What can I do to benefit humanity? It's not, an, I don't think it's enough for me to make sure that my kids have got a better standard of living than, than I had, got more opportunities than I had. I would hope that would be just a, taken for granted. So I don't want people standing around, you know, around the water cooler the day after I've kicked the bucket and say, hey, do you hear old Milburn's guy? Who? Oh, you must remember him. He's the guy who made sure his kids had a better living than he did. No, it's not enough. So one of my targets is on-orbit manufacture of mesenchymal stem cells. We already know from experiments on the space station that mesenchymal stem cells uh, grow at a phenomenal rate in, uh, in, in space. They're triggered by the actual boost of the launch. If you just carry them up there without doing that, they don't, they don't start. It's like a primer for the, uh, for the reaction. But once you've got them up there after that, they grow in three dimensions instead of a flat sheet like this. It'll bring down the cost of manufacture of these things. It'll build up the volume that you can produce by orders of magnitude. And if you haven't read about it, uh, read about mesocanal stem cells. Uh, it's biology magic. I mean, they're, they're getting people to walk that have had seven uh, nerves in their spinal column. Uh, it, it's just, it, it really is magic. So uh, we're already talking with a company in Israel, I hope they're still alive. Um, they've got an on-orbit lab <clears throat> that's designed for, for producing these mesenchymal stem cells. We've already one, done work with uh, University of Central Florida. Uh, we put cells into suborbital space to see if it triggers them, that works. So we need some more launches of that. So between those, I think we've got a path forward. Hypersonic transportation, okay, and right now we're looking at just the kind of the military aspects of it. Um, I should next week have been going out to uh, Midland for the high speed air transportation conference run by a good friend of ours, Oscar Garcia. The focus there is almost solely on hypersonics, not for military use, but for, uh, for transportation. Um, I've managed to skip this year and give that to somebody else. So I'm going to Colorado for a couple of weeks. Um, might not make this one. It's just going to be left to Elon. Uh, carry the seeds of life out of the souls. That even might be a step beyond beyond Elon. Uh, hope that guy doesn't burn himself out. But we're uh, we're meant to explore. As a race, we're meant to explore. Um, and of course, this quote. I hope you well, perhaps you don't know if you know aerospace engineers. Konstantin Tsiolkovsky. Uh, was the Russian aerospace genius. Um, the Tsiolkovsky rocket equation we still use to this, this day. Uh, the Earth is the cradle of humanity, but mankind cannot stay in the cradle forever. That thing stuck around with me for 10, 15 years. I saw it down at a convention in, in Florida. 
um, and ultimately we'll have to head out there. I don't think the planet's in any great danger at the moment, contrary to popular opinion. A uh, token of which artificial intelligence, you can't see the top there, we're all going to die. Uh, we're not. Um, it's a tool. Um, I, I meant to bring in, I didn't go to the office this week, I've been working from home, but I meant to bring in my, uh, my telescopic slide rule, which is what we used for doing calculations back in 1968. It's a you know, it's conventional slide rule, it's like 10, 12 inches long. Uh, the telescopic one has um, a five foot tape wrapped around a tube. It looks like a telescope slides in and out. Uh, and it literally makes a slide rule that's that long, so you can do three decimal precision with uh, with this thing. Um, I lost my, I didn't lost it, it was my original. Uh, it got broke. I hit a, hit a kid over the head with it because he was hitting on my girlfriend back in 69. So it was bent and it wouldn't work. So I bought one on, uh, on eBay. Uh, but, miracle looking thing. And I also got a mechanical calculator. We didn't have computers back then. So you want to do calculations. These things were about this size, made by Olivetti, it was purely electromechanical. So you'd plug in your numbers and pull it. It was like a slot machine. This thing would chunk away for about 30 seconds and print the answer out the top. And on a Friday, when we were leaving, we set all to divide all the nines by all the eights and set them all going. The whole building would shake as these machines bounced away on the top of the uh, but AI is, it's not truly artificial intelligence. This is something that John Carmack talked to us about when he came to visit about a year ago. Uh, large language model, you guys probably know more about this shit than I do. Um, there is work being done on true artificial intelligence. John will be one of the leaders in that, I think, with his humanoid. He thinks that by, by the end of the decade, uh, he can create a humanoid, a robot, um, that's got the intelligence level about a five-year-old. That's his, his target. Um, but, and again, this is where there's, there's not too many advantages to growing old, but one of them is at least you get a lot of experience to uh, to base your the decisions on. Um, and in my advice, uh, global nuclear war, okay, that was kind of a threat back in the 60s. Uh, it was over here as well, because these things can reach this far, ICBMs. Uh, personal computers, um, they were a threat when they first came on the scene. Mm -hmm. uh, I had an Olivetti P6060 was my first personal computer. It was supposed to be portable, and it was. It weighed about 60 pounds. <laughs> it had a, it was a, a single LED readout on this side. Uh, it had an inbuilt printer, so it was, that printer was actually built into the box. But because it bounced around so much, they had like a 10 pound piece of concrete on that side to stop it from moving around as it was printed in one of those dot matrix printers. Um, but that, that was going to take over. Yeah, good chance with that. Global cooling. Uh, you guys didn't get to see global cooling, 1970s. The same experts that are now um, lecturing us on, on global warming. It was global cooling. We're going to enter a new ice age unless we do something about it. And there was talk about spraying the Arctic and the Antarctic black from some kind of carbon deposit down there. So it absorbed more heat so we didn't all die of frostburn. Uh, the internet was a threat when it first came up, 1990s. iPhones and tablets, that's going to put everybody out of work. I don't need junior engineers if I've got an iPhone or a tablet that I can play with. And then 2010s, now we're coming into your era, global warming. Uh, those same experts that were doing the global cooling, now we're all going to die, about to swim around with the polar bears. Um, and then uh, some of the data is not quite working out the way we thought it was. The climate's changing. Yeah, okay, we've got climate change. That's the new one. So and, are you a climate change denier? No. Climate, of course, climate's changed for the last billion years. Yeah, of course it's changing. What I don't agree with is this apocalyptic anthropogenic climate change where we're, we're all going to be swimming in Dallas by the end of the year. Uh, I'm, I'm a confirmed skeptic. And then more recently, the China plague, unless you lock yourselves away and put three masks on, and when your bags come in from Walmart, you wash them down with Clorox wipes, which we did there. Can't believe I took them out of the back of the Jag and wiped down Walmart bags with them. Stupid. And now the new one, artificial intelligence. It is not a doomsday scenario. It does represent a threat. Don't, don't dismiss it. I'm not dismissing it. Some careers will be impacted. Uh, 
translators. Um, I've put a translator out of business this year. Um, we were looking at a court case in Dubai. Uh, we got a copy of the ruling from the court. It was in Arabic, all that squiggly little writing stuff. So I sucked it into a PDF, put it into an optical character reader, put that into, I think it was Claude II, and said, okay, translate this into English. I'll even go with American English, if you don't speak proper English. Uh, and do me a bullet point summary. I want the key takeaways and a bullet point summary. 10 seconds later, it's out there. That would have taken a, um, probably down to Houston to send that document for translation. It would have cost me a grand and it would have taken a week. This was 10 minutes. It was in my hands for nothing. Uh, legal clerks, our chief counsel who lives up in, uh, in, in Colorado, just outside of Breckenridge. Um, he uses that extensively now, stuff that he would have handed down to a junior in his office. He throws it into uh, into one of the AIs to do all that stuff and then has it check his final documentation. Artists, my eldest grandson is heavy into art and he's bitching at this thing because he said, and it could do better than I can, you know, like 1% of the time. So find another career. <laughs> Uh, and that list is going to grow. These are just the first three that I've had familiarity with in the last month. And then these are the questions that you came up with and a few others. Where do you think the future of aerospace and rocketry is headed? Uh, for commercial launches, it's going to be private. Elon is just kicking ass. Um, I think he's going to have 100 launches next year. Um, for research, that's still government funded, so they're going to farm some of that out to the legacy aerospace companies. Well, he's what it is. Um, hypersonic transportation, that's where my next focus is building on what we do for the DOD with hypersonics. The conference that I was supposed to go to next week, um, I've been there the last three years, and 90% of the presentations are for companies that enter hypersonic transportation. The ability to get from one place on the planet to another in an hour instead of 10, 12 hours. We're a long way from that yet, but we've got paths forward with it. Um, and then hypersonics for defense planes applications, we are about 10 years behind the Chinese on hypersonics for, for military applications. That's why that DIU thing is getting the best, best start. Space tourism to decline. Um, it was almost pure serendipity as I was driving here tonight. Um, I got an email from a guy called Dr. Stephen Collicott, who's professor of aerospace at Purdue. Um, and we did a, a test for him on a lunar lander leg using our Block 3 rocket back in September. And he's wanted to go on the next step because he said, I said, I can see the Vehicles available for suborbital launch declining over the next five to 10 years. And we said, yeah, we agree with you. Um, our biggest competitor in that is Virgin Galactic um, with that um, Spaceship One, I think the Spaceship Two now, which launches from underneath a special purpose vehicle. When you look at the finance behind it, it's hideous. It's almost as bad as Virgin Orbit. So when I crunch the numbers, I'm, I'm saying that if they keep going the way they're going, they need to launch five times a week, 52 weeks a year to break even. And that's if they can get people to pay the $400,000, $450,000 a seat. Right now, when they first started, it was like $100,000 to $200,000. So they're still going to burn their way through those tickets to get to those guys. As I was driving up, there was an email from, from Collicott saying, we need to talk next week. Um, I've just learned that Virgin has laid off a couple of hundred people. They need to. They've got 700, I think, working for them on that project. So 200 of them are on the streets now, which might be good for us because we're looking for engineers in general. But I think space tourism is going to decline. I don't see a path to profitability with, with the way their finances work. Do you see the future of aviation airspace in more efficient propellers and efficient, cheaper flights? No. Um, Prop driven planes are restricted. It's going to be small planes, short range. 
I think there's a chance for those to go electric propulsion. I've seen a couple of companies start to go that way. It doesn't work for bigger machines in a long distance. When you look at the energy density of batteries, and I'm looking at Biden, Lucid A, by the way. When you look at the energy density of batteries, it's a 50 to one ratio compared to aviation fuel. And when you burn in aviation fuel, guess what? Your mass reduces as you're flying along. Your batteries are still stuck in there. Don't even throw them off the side. Although they do that on, um, who's the guy down? Peter Beck. Um, Planet Lab? No, no, Planet Lab. Rocket Lab. Uh, they're out of New Zealand, Australia, but they're also going to play some of the uh, East Coast now. I think from uh, Virginia, yeah, Virginia Space Board. Um, he uses electric propulsion for his pumps, and then when he gets up, he throws the batteries over the side into the uh, the ocean. You can't do that with an airplane; it's going to get too damn expensive. So, for for large transportation, not a chance in hell. But you're going to do that with props or with uh, with batteries. I think we're about though, you know, we get to that plateau level when we're talking about reducing the cost of flight. Um, I was talking with a guy at Bowen at that last hypersonic conference, and he said that they're actually pulling away from hypersonics. They, they had a project and they shelved it. They're focusing on their conventional planes, trying to squeeze a bit more out of the, uh, the engines and efficiency. But when you compare the efficiency, those things are pretty damn good right now. So you squeeze another one, two percent out of it. Only thirty percent of the cost of transportation is the fuel. And then you look at the huge fluctuations that you're going to get in aviation fuel cost. I mean, it's it's gone up by twenty, thirty percent. So I don't think that can be hypersonics. I think is the new big move. When we say it's, they've done the market research and they think it's Mark Five's general cost of it hypersonic. I think it's actually going to be in that Mark three, Mark four range where the kind of curves intersect for, uh, for cost versus benefit. Um, but if you could fly Mark three, Mark four from existing airports, um, now you've got a business case to make because it won't be cheap. It's not going to be as cheap as those cheap flights there. Time is money. Um, when we have to fly across, we're working a deal with Japan. But we have to fly to Japan. That's a couple of days of my life getting there and another couple of days getting back. With hypersonic transportation, I could arrive there in the morning, do my business, probably have a sleepover and get some decent Chinese food, and then fly back again the next day. I mean, I've just saved myself four days of that half million dollar salary. What areas of business pose the greatest challenges that will need to be solved likely across all industries? For hypersonics, um, materials. Um, the three highest paid engineering professions are aerospace, chemical, or a, uh, and materials. Um, McKenzie, I think, was rated number seven in the list that I just saw. Damn good, but those are the top three. Um, we need something that can withstand air heat. We've got stuff that will withstand air heat then. But it tends to be disposable, you know, put a new pika slap on there. We want stuff that you can fly again and again and again on a daily basis. And that's not insignificant. Uh, hypersonic transport hubs will not allow sonic boom or takeoff or approach. NASA has been doing some interesting work with um, different airframe structures that seem like they may be a, a path to mitigation on this. But you're going to have to slow down long before you get to uh, your landing spot or takeoff. It may be that you can only land on coastal areas, so you can slow down as you come out over the ocean. For the suborbital over the launch industry, regulatory. Oh, Lord, it's, it's hideous. Um, I've dealt with the guys at FAST now for close to 20 years. Um, I've worked my way through three of their associate directors. They've all died of gone on to something else. Uh, they introduced what was called streamlined launch license regulation, 14 CFR Part 450. Only the government could call it streamlined. <laughs> it's hideous. Um, and it's becoming a choke point. Um, SpaceX Starship, they just got a license to launch, I think, within the last week. Um, they've been sitting there waiting to go for several months now. Their launch cadence is restricted by the ability with which they can get a launch license because it's orbit specific as well. The good news on Starlink is they go on the same thing every time. 
um, Simon Titular, who's their uh, their licensing engineer, you know, I speak fairly, fairly regularly, and he is just totally distraught um, to the point where we, the feds are now sticking their heads in, a couple of congressional committees are beating the AST to death. Uh, you can't read the rest of that. In the past decade, launch cadence has quintupled. We're on schedule for over 100 launches this year and probably 150 maybe next year. It depends which project gets sanctioned. Uh, from the FAA standpoint, in that same period, that past decade, uh, their numbers have gone up by 10%. There's now 110 of them instead of 100 people who come there. And then you throw on that this part 450 debacle, uh, it's, they are just getting beat to death. Some really good people there. Don't get me wrong. These, these got some really sharp people, some graybeards there, and some new kids that I've just started dealing with this this past year with their nuclear business. But they're they're up, they're up against an ass whooping with, with what's coming up here. From your perspective, what's the limited factor for business industry, complexity, commercial interests? Design complexity for employees. Three most important factors. Funding, number one. Funding, number two. Funding, number three. We can handle the rest of it. That's just engineering. You know, aerospace rockets, it's just noisy plumbing with some smarts that came up to fly it. You probably thought that was Gus Grissom. It wasn't. It was a guy called Patrick Westmoreland um, who coined that. It's great group, uh, and it's the major problem with an advancement. VC financing, which is where a lot of this money comes from, uh, is down sixty-seven percent this year, mostly because of what's happening with Bidenomics and screwing the market. So, um, and rates, even if you can get funding, it's gone up from five to six percent per annum interest rates. We're in the fifteen percent range now for the, the debt finance if, if you can find it. It's a big, big problem. Okay, opportunities for aerospace clubs. You got your phones, you can use your phones on this one. But I'm really clever. I've got these QR codes now I can generate because of AI. Um, flight Opportunities Program. We've flown probably 20 payloads through the NASA Flight Opportunities Payload Program, UCF, uh, University of Purdue, Dormstadt in Germany. Um, one of the big um, cancer outfits down in Houston. Um, NASA will fund not only the build of the suborbital payload, but also the flight of it, um, usually from Spaceport America. <clears throat> I think Virgin's going to disappear before too very long. For scientific payloads, they've got to fly people, they can't afford to fly these payloads. Um, that link gets you there, and that QR code will take you to the NASA Flight Opportunities website. Good people. I've, I've worked with them for 10, 12 years now. Um, and we still work with a lot of the same people. We have the same people in there, John people in this, this group. Um, you've got to come up with the idea. You pitch it to them. If they like it, um, they will fund the design and build of it, and they will fund the flight of it on a suborbital vehicle. Their mission has changed a little bit. They're now coming out and saying, we want to expand flight opportunities to orbital program as well. Um, they already do balloons and suborbital, but they're now looking to do orbital vehicles as well. So that's when the, what was called Launcher One will be Jaguar One for us. Uh, that will fly under the NIA, that's a flight opportunities paper. Uh, collegiate Propulsive Lander Challenge. This is a new one. This cropped up about two weeks ago. Um, the DCX, if you haven't looked at the DCX before, it was a phenomenal program. It was one of the best run government programs in the history of government. Um, they built a LOX hydrogen um, lander that went up several thousand kilometers uh, and then landed back again on the same path. Uh, small team, low cost. I think the budget on that was like $20 million. Federal government can't buy toilet rolls for $20 million. Um, really good program. Um, Jess Sponable was a major at the time. He's now formed his own hypersonic company that he's working on. But they all got back together. I think it was their 30th anniversary of the DCX launches. They did that 
last week in California. And they came up with this um, collegiate propulsive lander challenge and there's several prizes there. Uh, TBZ on fire, I throw my fire, I don't know what the best touch color one is. Tempered hover, it's an easy one. We, every vehicle we build, we hover test, even the rockets. Um, and then the Hop 50K, uh, that QR code will get you to their website. I haven't been onto it yet. It's been, it really is two weeks, two weeks old. But it's been funded by donations from the Grey Beard engineers from, from this outfit. Uh, and then this is another one from NASA Flight Opportunities Program. This is new as well. Uh, Universal Payload Integration Challenge, a design of payload adapter that can be used across a wide range of platforms. And they're doing this because they're moving in that orbital program. Uh, they want a universal payload adapter that they can just move from vehicle to vehicle. Um, and that's the QR code for that. Um, I think that's a quarter million dollar pitch they're making on that. And they may do more than one as well. I know that um, UCF's working on it. I know that Purdue is working on it. I don't know of anybody else other than those two, but it is relatively, uh, relatively recent. That was all the stuff that I had from you guys. What other questions have you got? Have I just bored you to tears? Yeah, it's um well we have we have radioisotope generators on everything that goes out to the uh, the stars and the moon. But for propulsion, um they did build a nuclear powered bomber back in the 50s and 60s. There's still some information on the website about that. Oh, that was the top paid profession, uh, top paid engineering profession was nuclear engineering. Um, it's got problems because, of, I mean, it's highly efficient. You can generate phenomenal amounts of power from a fairly small, small power plant. But if you've got people in there as well, you're going to have some pretty extensive shielding around that. Now, having said that, it can be done. Um, John Quinn, who's our CEO, used to be a submariner. He worked on the, uh, the nuclear salts so in his youth, and his job was maintaining the electricals around the nuclear plants on that. They have one of the best safety records of any industry working with, with nuclear. So it's, it's possible. I'm not sure that you'll get past the regulatory requirements. So I'm running that past FAST or FAA if you're doing uh, air transportation. Um, and I think that'll put a lot of companies off that could afford to do it. I mean, again, you don't mind pitching in a billion dollars for something if you think it'll work and generate billions. But if they're fighting that uphill battle with the environment and stuff, um, I'm not going to plug my nickel in. I don't have more questions than that. I can't answer every question. I have another question. Uh, you mentioned that we went to the industry many weeks ago. There was a quite a bit of competition from mentioned things from Sondos to grad, college graduate versus part that part into experienced professionals that might feel from some other industry like that. As students, are there ways that the sort of skills or sort of things that we can do or pursue that makes ourselves especially uh, knowledgeable in these industries or like learning more knowledge moving forward or yeah, who was your sidekick that uh, said he couldn't make it to the end? Uh, oh, uh, Dr. Uh, sorry, Kenny. Mr. Kenny. Sinclair. Kenny, okay. Yeah, Kenny's a, a machinist, right? Yes. He learned the machine, learned the 3D print. Um, every one of the guys in our place can run a CNC machine, uh, which is why we can do with six people what NASA takes 200 to do with. Um, so yeah, if you get, if you got a secondary skill like that, that's worth its weight in gun. Um, and try and get some, this is tough, try and get some practical experience, do internships with, um, if not aerospace, whatever industry you're going into, uh, so you can get out in the field. I mean, um, we're gonna be launching in September of next year. Hit us up and see if there's something that you could tie in. It might not be a paid gig, but you can get out in the field and actually see what a launch operation looks like.
So you mentioned also when talking about CNC 3D printing, mm -hmm. and I was curious how does how is 3D printing currently applied in the aerospace industry? <laughs> like high temperature peak 3D printing versus stuff like yeah, ADS. There's a company out in California called Relativity Space. Um, and the uh, two young kids, I think they're from USC or UCAL, um, Caltech, uh, they started that company up. They got their first funding from, who was the guy who runs the Mavericks? Um, yeah, him. Um, Mark Cuban. Mark Cuban, yeah. And of course, once Mark Cuban put some money in, a bunch of other fools followed along behind them. And just because you can do something doesn't mean you should. So their forte was they were going to 3D print rockets, every last stinking piece of it. The tanks, the engine, print engines, we've got no problems with that. Tanks, yeah, okay. Just because you can doesn't mean you should. Um, and he's a neat kid. I know him really well. Uh, back in, golly, how old is Nate now? Nate's 32. So 20 years ago, this kid that started Relativity Space used to come to my house and play Dungeons and Dragons and build Lego models in, the, in our front room. He lived like a mile away from us in the same neighborhood. Um, he went off and he was going to do a degree in something totally unrelated and then switched to aerospace. And then when he graduated, they started Relativity Space. So they, they th literally 3D printed an orbital rocket from the ground up. Uh, they launched from... Uh, the Cape that was about six months ago. Didn't quite work. I think their second stage failed on them. Don't think it was related to the 3D printing. Um, but instead of fixing that problem, and I think the problem would have been fixable, they decided to jump up an entire class of vehicle. I mean, they, they're going from, from a Falcon 1 to a Falcon heavy size vehicle in a single jump, not having resolved the problems on their early vehicle. Uh, that's a mistake, in my humble opinion. He's richer than I am, but I think most of his riches came from Mark Cuban. Um, and the new rocket, they're not going to 3D print. That's a smart move, because 3D printing brings nothing to the structure of the rocket. It allows you to do some really neat things with engines. We'll be 3D printing our orbital engines. Um, the technology's already there. It's proven. There's a couple of companies down in Houston that build the 3D printing machines. Um, 3D print and copper plus some other alloys and then coat them. Um, the cooling that you put in the inside wall there, have you ever seen the engines on the, uh, the, the Saturn V that's down in uh, Johnson Space Center? Uh, you look at the, I mean, it's immaculate. Those guys were miracle workers. There's hundreds upon hundreds of little tubes which they're running the, uh, the fuel through before it comes into the, the combustion head. Um, and it's to cool the walls down so the engines don't melt. You can 3D print those, and instead of all these myriads of little tubes that they'll have to hand tack into place, I, I'm amazed that a Saturn V ever got off the ground. It, it is a miracle of engineering. It's the most complex machine, apart from the shuttle, that, uh, that, that ever flew. Um, but yeah, through 3D printing's got its place, but building tanks is not. We're, we're doing um, composite wound tanks now. We own a company out in California called Scorpius, same guys that built those helium tanks for us. Um, and we bought them because they have a patented technology for building linoless composite tanks. So you don't have to have a titanium shell inside to wrap around it. It literally is just the composite structure. And we've got tanks that go up to 5,000 pounds. Um, our helium tank on the block three in the Sarge goes up to 5,000 pound gaseous pressure. Um, it, it's amazing technology. And it's out of autoclave as well. You don't need to autoclave the damn thing. You just let it sit there in ambient temperature for, I think it's 72 hours and, uh, and, it, and it seals off. It's great, great stuff. So don't need to 3D, 3D print those. That that's, takes a long time. It's hideously expensive. And I think their success rate with high pressure is very good. Didn't need it for theirs because theirs were a pump fit engine. So 40, 50 pounds was enough to just prime the pump. Yeah, that's it. There's probably a dozen pieces in, in one of our rockets that will 3D print. The more complex it is to build lots of internal stuff, 
that would make it typical of fabricant. Otherwise, that's where it wins out, but not from big structures like that. That's cool. Air breathing engine. Uh, really, like those first stage with over launches or sort of hydrogen peroxide, sort of other sort of yeah, so air breathing for a first stage of a conventional rocket engine, talking ground launch, yeah, it's not effective. Um, I guess we are, we have a stage zero with the uh, the Boeing 747 there, that, that's conventional rocket, uh, conventional uh, jet engine, so that's getting us up to 35,000 feet. Uh, which means that when you drop that puppy off and it's a LOX Caro, I think on the launcher one, uh, now you've got conventional rocket engines. And obviously, once you get 35,000 feet, you're probably about the limit for, uh, for unless you want military stuff, uh, for, uh, for an air breathing engine. And you want to be out of that shit as fast as you can, reduce your drag. Mm -hmm. What about like other fuels like hydrogen peroxide and things like that? Yeah. No, that's something that's not cryogenic. Or... Yeah. Um, going back to Armadillo Aerospace days, then um, our very first engines were hydrogen peroxide um, rocket test grade, which is like ninety eight percent plus peroxide. Most most peroxide, you know, you go to the, the drugstore and you get three percent. Okay, that means ninety seven percent of it's just water. And in fact, I met Russ Blink and Phil Eaton before we even got to Armadillo Aerospace. Um, they were in the same rocketry club, they were one of the same meets. Um, and Russ was trying to produce rocket grade peroxide in his garage at home. Good idea. Um, and you can buy commercially, you can buy 50%. But what he was trying to do was to distill it so that he was left with higher grade. You can't do that. You can't distill. 50% peroxide to get anything much stronger than that. Because the, the, the water's boiling off. Yeah, but the peroxide's decomposing at almost the same rate that it's losing the water. So you've got this kind of flattens out of about 60%. You have to do what's called sparging, which is where you bubble air through it, micro bubbles preferably. That will take out the, uh, the water, leaving the hydrogen peroxide behind. That's how they produce commercial rocket grade hydrogen peroxide. And there's a guy up in wherever they got the old missile silo, it's Dakota, not Dakota, South Dakota. Uh, he brew some up there. Uh, we made some ourselves here in Texas. And then there's another guy down in San Antonio that, that was, was making it. Um, when, um, oh, Andy Beale was making, uh, that Beale Aerospace guy, his rockets were going to be hydrogen peroxide and Caro, I think. And he was bringing in 50% peroxide from Germany. And he had a sparge and still in um, just outside of Waco, where their test center is now, which will probably help build some of that for him. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, you, you, can't, you can't do that. And we, we used, we bought our peroxide from the guy in, in uh, North Dakota. Uh, we built probably 50 or 60 different peroxide engines. Um, when we had problems, Get in peroxide, a uh, reasonable enough grade to start with. We get that from some after down in Houston, and they wouldn't sell it to us for safety reasons. Thought we're going to blow ourselves up and then sue them. Um, we said that okay, uh, let's try fifty percent peroxide and ethanol or methanol. So it was a byproduct, and we built some engines like that. The problem is getting the damn stuff to ignite. And it's got fifty percent water in the uh, in the peroxide. You're fighting a battle. So we had these silver screen catalysts, um, brought the silver in from India. Um, and I could we could get a couple of three ignitions out, but then the catalyst would get fouled up and it wouldn't ignite properly the next time to produce a lot of steam and no thrust. Um, this is this is back in the early part of 2000s when we were just a bunch of Yahoos playing around with rocket stuff. And we had a, we had an absolute blast with that stuff. Um, we uh, we put our, CT, our current CTO, we strapped him into a capsule and dropped him off a crane with a crushable nose cone to see if that would absorb the shock. It did, but not quite as well as Russ would have liked. And <laughs> we did some crazy, crazy, crazy. He, uh, he did our first uh, manned lander flight. Uh, he was in a biohazard suit because we were using the high-grade peroxide as our rocket fuel. 
and we had this steel frame and we strapped them into that and he had peroxide on this side and he has ethanol on this side, a couple of hydrogen tanks, even tanks at 5,000 PSI behind his head. And we tied him down with chains to the ground so he didn't go too far. And then we stood well back and they put me off while he hovered around in the parking lot in Garland for about 10 seconds. So that was our first manned, <laughs> manned flight. <laughs> yeah, we're maybe still alive. Russ has missed a few bits now from when we were making our own igniters. He was doing something with some pyrogen he was mixing up in a steel can. Um, and we had to test every once in a while. And when he opened the can, there were some particles of the pyrogen that got caught in the uh, threads of the can. And a little bit of friction was enough to set it off, and it blew off the ends of a couple of his things. Uh, he was a lucky dude to get away with that one. Missed his face. Yeah, but hydrogen peroxide. Um, yeah, you're looking at energy density, and it sucks. Uh, I mean, lux hydrogen, great. You've got the these there. Uh, we're using lux ethanol, which is slightly worse than lux caro, JP1, all those. The reason we use ethanol is it's clean. I mean, there are no carbon residues whatsoever. So we, the engine that we built for the rocket-powered racer, um, before Len Fox, our test pilot, would climb into that thing, he said, yeah, I'm going to have to relight this in flight. Because um, if they flew, lit the engine, uh, he couldn't fly for more than 10 seconds in a straight line, or else he'd reach VNE, velocity not exceed, and the wings would fall off. Uh, so he either had to cut the engine off or had to go into a steep climb. And even then, it, it, he was hauling ass. So at some point, I had to switch the engine off and, and coast and, and uh, relight. So he said, I want to see that engine light a thousand times in a row before I'm going to climb in that thing. So we literally strapped it onto a test bed on the back of our crane truck. And for days, we were just there. A thousand times in a row. Everyone was a success. No failures in the, uh, in the engine at all. And because it was Lux ethanol, the small injectors were just beautifully clean. If you've done that with Lux Caro, you're going to get carbon deposits. You're going to get the gummy. And if you launch into orbit, I'm going to burn for two minutes and then you throw it over the side. So not a problem. So for our orbital vehicle, that's going to be Lux Caro or Lux JP1, something like that. May change the Lux hydrogen to the upper stage at some point, just for the extra performance. But for ethanol, was it, how pure is it? Oh, this, yeah, we, we buy this especially from, um, I forget what they call it now, uh, special terminology. I mean, it's damn near 100%. There's a small fraction of water in there. Right. But yeah, it's going to be 99 point something. And we buy it from an outfit in East Texas who, who brew the stuff in the plant out there. Yeah. Now you can't just go. Of that stuff. Well, it's the same thing with um, we built um, built an engine that would work on on LNG as well, LNG and LOX. Um, just before we did the LOX methane engine for for NASA, and the uh, the LNG you had to get a special grade of that as well, which was clean. Otherwise, you get common problems with some of the heavies that are still in there, and you can't use pipeline gas because they stick those foaming one of one of these uh, those nasty smelling compounds in there so you know you've got a gas leak that methane doesn't smell so they've got to put a sulfur in there to make it smell you guys must have some questions yeah I have to ask they can go first the language what method of the um that's a really good question um we made our own flight com control computer. Uh, the programming was well, originally all came from John Carmack. I mean, John's a, a game genius. I don't know if you guys play those games, I've never played a computer game in my life. Uh, but Quake and Doom and Wolfenstein 3D and the stuff they did for Oracle. Guy's a coding genius. I mean, just brilliant what he does. So he literally did, did the code from day one, from that first symbol on down. And you find problems with it. One of John's philosophies was um, build, test, pray, rinse, repeat. So there'd be nights where, you know, talking about engines. Um, we had a place down in Garland 
Um, Russ Blink owned a company that made those little pages you get when you go to a restaurant and you're waiting for a table. And we used to work out the back of his shop and then we test in the parking lot behind this, his building. And there'd be Saturday nights where we would uh, be testing a rocket engine. We'd blow it up or melt something off. So we'd haul it back in, we'd hack it, repair it, figure out what was wrong, take it back to the tent. It'd be nice where we'd do three and four tests of a rocket engine on a Saturday evening. Um, just rapid turn. And he said, that's the only way you can do this stuff. Is because in the computer industry, imagine if you wrote your code and then you ran it and it was a month later before you get to change what was run on it. So the code is great. You can run it, it really works. And you keep recycling fast. And he applied the same philosophy to, uh, to Armadillo Aerospace. That's why we can do with six people what NASA takes 200 to do. And then from a control standpoint, um, <laughs> We tried a whole bunch of different stuff. We had a small engine on each leg, a four leg lander, and we used pulse width uh, modulation of the, uh, of the rocket engines to, to keep it stable and try and do different angles so you could control rolling as well. Uh, and that was, oh, that was a lot of fun. We burned a lot of midnight hours on that one. So eventually we went to a single gimbal engine. Um, and then that comes to do anything but roll control in a single engine. So we had outboard LOX thrusters, high level and low level, that controlled the, uh, the roll of the thing, roll of the thing was playing. Um, and that, that worked like a champ. Um, but again, that was all down to programming by John. As we moved on to the suborbital vehicles and the new stuff that we're working with, um, because we were working on a government contract, uh, we managed to get the source code for Project Morpheus, which was written by NASA. And it's not just for that launch vehicle, it's kind of a, a suite of software that you can tune to do whatever you want. You can make it a suborbital rocket, you can make it a lunar lander, you can use it for an orbital vehicle, you can use it for dynamic interceptive and incoming missile, it's phenomenal. And, and we get that free of charge because we're working on a government contract. That was what was in Morpheus. It's what's in our Sarge launch vehicles, what's in the Block 3, and what's on these vehicles as well. Once we replace the stuff they've got on the, on the launch and Um But yeah, it's a monstrous amount of code. Monstrous amount. You were the programmer, coder? No, it's just like the other guy, our message on the right there now. Okay. So I on Kimball. Yeah, single engine. Yeah, good. So, okay. It, there's issues with it. <laughs> there's a lot of things that the signal would be way out of our scope. It's it's better than some of the alternatives. We were competing against an outfit in California called Maston Aerospace, um, and when they started up, they had I think four engines on each leg of their vehicle on outboard. And they were trying to control it with that, and they must have crashed it a bunch of times. <laughs> and in the end, John Carmack, our guru, said, he's, he's screwing around. We've proved him that's a hard way to go. Single engine, separate roll control system. Uh, and that eventually got them in the air. They actually won prizes at the uh, North and Grimmel Lunar Lander Challenge. Uh, they got a contract from NASA to build a lunar lander to go to the moon. And then they went belly up because they. Uh, they got off track, put their eye off the ball, did some stupid stuff. Um, they got bought out by Astrobotic, who I think of as about a lunar lander that's going to moon. And then Intuitive Machines, um, that was those are the guys that were originally from NASA, um, formed their own company, Intuitive Machines, and they've got a lander that'll be going up on a SpaceX rocket next year now, I think. I think Astro Astrobotic goes up this year and they go up next. But yeah, it's. Yeah, there are problems with it, but they're solvable because we've got four different companies that actually have seen it. And that's the way the original moon land was built, single, single gimbal engine, which is interesting. You're going to get a chance to climb inside one of the original lunar landers. I think they've still got one down at Kennedy's, uh, maybe Johnson Space Center at the museum. Uh, it's how the hell those guys did it. I don't I couldn't get in. I'm too tall to go down. And they literally, there's like a bench seat. It's kind of like this that they sit on. And the engine's underneath there. So you can lift up and there's an engine sitting below there. And in case the valves 
didn't open when the command was given by the computer, they could lift this up and there was two handles there. So they could quite literally just open the valves like this and then put this sit down again because it's on. <laughs> Yeah, you know, it's just a marvel when you look inside those things that those guys survived. Incredible. Yeah, don't give up on that. So I wanted to ask if you had any advice for our rocketry team as we prepare for the space for America. Uh, tell me what your rocket is and what you're going to do with it. So we are registered for the 10,000 10, uh, 10, feet Apache uh, commercial off the shelf competition. Okay. And we're tur currently, uh, we have simulations about 10,000, 12,000 feet. It's just a rocket going about mock on the simulation. Which and what simulator are you using? Currently, open rocket and we're switching to any system other. System. Okay. Yeah, I would, I would move away from that one. I'll talk with Phil as well, because I think he's got um, a program that he used to use way back when, when we were an experimental rocketry. Um, because I guess you, you what class motor do you got on the air motor? Oh, you got an M. Oh, that's cool. I like those. <laughs> uh, M1315. Who's still 1315? Who's who's motor? Uh, I think we're using Airtech 2500. Okay, okay. Uh, yeah. it's called Blue Thunder. Maybe. Oh, it's all changed. I remember I'm, that was 25 years ago that I was playing with that stuff. Yeah, and I used to make my own at that point as well. Um, yeah, I, I would, um, I'll, I'll talk with Phil maybe this weekend on Monday. I'm going to the office on Monday and see what he's, he's using on that. Because um, he, he's tried like 10 different programs for the simulator. Uh, but the class, I mean, the, the mode of thrust profile, that's no problem. Those guys are pretty good Aerotech. I used to use those way back when. Um, so that piece of it's good. So it's the aero, where are you getting your aero from? Is it buried into the code? Uh, yes, I think so. It's, in, it's embedded in Open Rocket. It has all the profiles for the. Okay. Um, there's another piece of software that you should be able to get open source online called missile.com. Um, that's what we use. I mean, it, it is powerful. Um, I can put wings on it, uh, I can put multiple engines, um, and it'll do you the uh, six off arrow on. On that come up with all the parameters. I mean, really, all you're interested in is is the drag at different alpha angles. Um, yeah, take a look at that, and I'll chop with Phil and see if I can get you something on, the, on that. And, and after that, it's just tuning it. Okay, it's gone too high. No problems. I stick some mass in the tune it with the mass. Is that what you're doing? Uh, right. Yeah, that's a, that's how we do our yeah. our survival rockets. Is, it's going to go too high. Okay, we'll stick another bucket of paint in there. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Actually, we, we can actually shut the engine off. We have a TTS in there as well, thrust termination system. So it's saying, okay, if I keep going at this rate, how high am I going to go? And as soon as it reaches the, uh, the target altitude, um, we can say, okay, that's it, cut it off. And it has a set of thrust termination valves in there. They also serve for safety purposes. So if it starts going, oh, I'm going to head towards El Paso, um, we, we've got in the code there that it automatically shuts it off if it's going to fall outside a seven kilometer range, something like that. I think it's down to six and a half. And so you, do, you obviously don't need that on yours because you're not guided, you're just going straight up. And they're making you launch that from uh, Space for America? Yeah, we're watching the, the competition of Space for America Cup down in Mexico. Uh, so oh, wow. Going down there for the big competition. So for our first year, we're going to 50,000 feet. Uh, in future years, they have 30,000 foot yeah. top level. So then, like the next year, when people are going to try to launch ours, 30,000 feet. And then, as you should sort of prove your worth there, then you know what you're doing. It's not just you know, showing it there. You can just keep moving. Who, who runs the program down at Space for America? Uh, I think. Currently, Estra is running this competition. It's a joint Here collaboration with a lot of different uh, NASA can be as well. Uh, Lockheed Martin's part of it. So oh, no, I'm just with Space, Space for America. Are you dealing with? Oh, you've not got that. Oh, yet. well, uh, I'm not sure what sponsor is. Well, I'm not sure what sponsor I mean, it's, 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 it's a state run agency. Um, Bill Goodman used to be the range director out there. He retired, but he came back because the young kid that was taken over from him decided. He didn't like New Mexico, so he went down to back to Florida. 
Yeah, I'm not sure it's the same thing. Do we know uh, there's a, a gentleman named Dr. Overton uh, that Ken Overton that is in the Dallas area that he's a reach of the auction there, but as far as who's the big poncho down there? Yeah, there's yeah, no big poncho. <laughs> I'm going to say half a lifetime ago, it wasn't, but it was only like a third of a lifetime ago. Um, Bill Richardson was the governor of, uh, of New Mexico at that time, and he sent his director of economic development to meet with me in Dallas. I haven't got the slightest idea why this guy was coming out. We, we talked about doing stuff out there so long before Spaceport America was built. I used to go to their conferences out there. Um, and I had dinner with this guy at a Mexican restaurant somewhere in Richardson. And he said, would you be interested in coming and uh, starting up the spaceport in, uh, in New Mexico? I go, no. <laughs> uh, we, I mean, we were, it was Armadillo Aerospace days. We're having an absolute blast building this stuff up. So I didn't want to be doing a construction project in, in New Mexico. Anyway, they burned through four or five different people there and since that was 2005, I guess. So yeah, it's pretty tough. Oh, you've never you've been out there for already? No? Yeah, the COVID uh, had mentioned so it took a week. It was yeah. a bit difficult for just being allowed. The good news is <laughs> they built a road so you can get to it now. Oh, actually, yeah. yeah, it used to be a dirt track that went through the what you jokingly call farms back there. It's all peppers they grow, patch chili peppers. Um, and you have to get out every once in a while and open a gate to drive through and close it again so the cows didn't get out. Um, <laughs> And then you came up from the south end of the range. Now there's a road that they paved that runs all the way from the interstate up to the gate at the, uh, the spaceport. It's all fenced up. They got guards and guns and everything. Um, and then once you're in there, they'll send you down the southern end of the range on a, on a gravel road. But it's so much easier compared to uh, 15 years ago. It's good, good look at good people as well. Really good people. So while I was a student, it's a bit concerned. I can talk to Professor Hicks at our speed and also concerned. And while I know that increasing the mass would be a way to reduce the speed, I was wondering if it'd be possible to change the design of it so you have a higher bit coefficient so you can just make more time as you increase the speed instead of increasing mass. Can you do it that way? Yes. Uh, would I advise it? No. Mass. I can easily calculate that. I put a scale in. Yep. That one's happened now. Um, changing the aerodynamics, you've got to come back to missing DATCOM on those other programs to see what the CD changes are. And not only just the CD, you've got to do it with different angles of attack so you've got some variability in what the wind conditions are. Um, is it how close you can get to 10,000 feet? Yeah. Okay. So over, over under even. Uh, yes, and there's a twenty percent max twenty percent. Otherwise, you just didn't get the the actual. Okay. Um, if I was doing it, and I had the money, <laughs> what's the problem funding? Okay. Um, I would get make sure you've got a good sim on it. I'll go out and fly the bloody thing and see how close you can get to it. I haven't said that. What's an M thirteen cost now? M thirteen fifty. About seven hundred. Well, the two thousand five hundred I have is about eight hundred dollars and a thousand dollars for the case. For the case, and let me check and see if we've got. Is it ninety eight millimeter? Uh, yes. Yeah. Let me check and see if we've got one at, or at the office. I think we gave all that stuff away. I gave all mine to a bunch of guys from SpaceX. Um, there were some of them when Beale Aerospace shut down, and they get away from the, abandoned McGregor. SpaceX took over McGregor, and that's where they test all the Merlin engines. Um, and they had a couple of young engineers. Their place was a shithole. Um, and they were sitting in a bunker there, and there was water on the floor when they first got there. It had been flooded. Um, a couple of young guys, and they were playing around in aerospace, but they were working for Elon. Um, and I just gave them a box full of stuff that was sitting in my garage because we were moving on to bigger things. And I know there was... There was a 98 in there, there was a 76. Get that one over this floor. And then I had four J cases as well. Um, and the, the 98, that's, that's what I used for, uh, for my, that might have been an N class. Because I built an N the last time around. 
but I'm, I'll see if Phil's got anything sitting in the way. We got a bunch of old stuff there. He's still got his um, plane in there that was rocket powered. Let's see if he's got one that, that work. But yeah, what you do is you run your sims. The engine thrust curve is pretty pretty damn good. Uh, so then you figure out what ballast you need, and then you just fly the damn thing and see how close that is. That's what we do with our several other rockets. I mean, um, we've put our launch license application in for Sarge and again for Block Three, and it's this is what we're going to do. Yeah, okay. Um, and the only reason they'll give us a launch license is because we've got the thrust termination system that we can kill it with. It's been 100% reliable over a thousand plus tests. Um, but until we've flown it that first time, um, we're putting hand on heart that we, we think we know what's what's going to happen, but always going to be a problem. Around. And then you get wind shear effects. You, know, you get above uh, ground level at Spaceport America, up to it's, it's 4,000 something feet. Uh, you get up to about 10,000 feet. Now you're above the San Andreas mountain range, so the wind comes sweeping in from there. Uh, and you're going to get those uh, those winds, shear winds coming across. Uh, now we've got to hope our guidance does what it's supposed to. So you're always looking at telemetry coming down because uh, as it starts pushing, it's going to nose into the wind. So we've got to thrust vector back this way. Okay, there's an inefficiency because I'm now fighting that sideways drift to keep it on center. So until you've done the actual test, uh, it's just, yeah, that's really nice figures, but I wouldn't bet money on it. Okay, the test, but yeah, but that's that was some bucks a shot. Yeah, but you you don't have to go to space with America to test it. You can test it around here. Um, yeah, we're trying to do a couple of some rocket jumps here, so we're trying to do a bunch of tests. Yeah, in a, in like in Seymour, Texas, or the close launch site, but they have a launch like cap of between fifteen thousand and thirty thousand feet, and so or ten thousand projects, well within their limits. Yeah, it's in fact I. I've heard of that launch site. I've never been to it because they started up long after we'd finished. It was right. the Dallas Area Rocket Society. Uh, yeah, they're Tripoli or Texas. Okay. <laughs> yeah, we um, we used to launch up in Argonia, Kansas every summer in August. It was horrible. It's like a thousand degrees and it's a cornfield that's been flattened and it used to get burned every time we went out there. But we, we held a national rocket launch there. There's another one out in Amarillo. If, it, if this one works for it, go for it. That's the closest uh -huh. one you've got. We did test down in McGregor as well one year. Um, there was a national rocket launch in LDRS in uh, in McGregor. And then I was co-director with um, Pat Godzolik. He lives out in Amarillo for LDRS 10, 12, 15 years ago. Um, I, think it was, I think it was called Happy Texas. I wasn't happy the first day when it pissed down. It was like three inches of rain on the ground. Um, but we did get the launch away the next two days, it tied out. Um, but that's a five, six hour drive. So if that one works, do that. Yeah, it's, it's only about a six hour drive to West of you, so. Yeah, it's, it's nothing. Yeah, so, it is hard to have with the DFW Air Force and the field around the Bay Area. So. Space, Spaceport America is uh, a 14 hour drive from here. Right. I've done it <laughs> several times, sometimes hauling a rocket trailer. We're debating that for getting a rocket down there. <laughs> getting to a, well, what size is this thing? Uh, about nine and a half feet long. In diameter? Uh, it's six inch, six inch diameter. Oh, okay. Uh, but it's presumably sectioned. Yes. Oh, yeah. Back of an SUV. That one is trying to I was driving. Spirit in the Sky 3 was my level three rocket. And that was 15 foot and a foot diameter, about two foot over the fins. And I think I used to drive that around in an Equinox or something before the back seats down. And it was called Spirit in the Sky. Um, I was going to Argonia for a launch with the pre prior rocket, which is painted white. Um, as I'm driving up there, it's like midnight going into Kansas. And that uh, Nolan Greenbaum song comes on Spirit in the Sky. I thought that is a cool name for a rocket. So we've got the hotel, I was sticking gold letters on this thing. But we launched out there, and that became the generic name for the next next couple of rockets as well. A long time ago and again, I see that one. But yeah, it just pulled it to pieces. These sound making your rocket for God, it's fun. Even though you need, you need an explosive license for that. Right. You know, 
I think mine's expired now. I'm curious. Uh, so y'all switched over to Flipwit just for the, the higher fuel efficiency Volvo launches. Have y'all did y'all consider doing like the solids and the solid chlorine key? Um, I mean, we, we've got a lot of experience with solids because of our right. hobby rocketry stuff. Um, but it's really difficult to tune a solid. I mean, you, uh, if you've seen the um, seen the solids that lifted the shuttle up, if you look at the internal structure of that grain, it's designed to produce a specific thrust profile. And, and you light it, and it's going to go. Uh, but you can't tune it at all. And some people have tried playing around with the nozzles, variable float nozzles, but that's a recipe for disaster. So the grain structure is literally what controls the thrust profile. Because you want it to tail off a little bit as you go through what through Mark One, uh, and then you drop most things up again as you get into what um, past that to that bucket curve in the uh, in the, in the drag co coefficient. So they're, they're phenomenally powerful. Energy density is good, uh, but they're they're expensive, and you can't you can't customize the the profile other than from the design point. Liquid liquid engines, I turn the valve. We can do whatever the heck I want with it. The power of engines there, we can throttle them down to 30% and they're still stable at 30% thrust rated. And I can push them to 110 and they'll survive for quite some time with that. But there's no way of doing that same kind of profile. Definitely not in flight. I mean, you can 